Our first speaker is John Farrell, the director of the Energy Democracy Initiative at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. This new social movement rejects the status quo and pushes to put consumers in charge. Mr. Farrell will bring in his expertise in distributed generation resources and public ownership and share how to incorporate renewables into the grid to promote economic development. Take it away, Don. Rosanna, you mentioned this morning that it might have been better to have this during the polar vortex, but as someone from Minnesota, I can say it's still a pleasure to come <laughs> even in March. Um, I also wanted to echo what some speakers this morning have said, uh, just to thank you for listening in English. Um, as I say about my college level Spanish classes, yo escucho bien, pero hablo mal. So you are much better off listening to me in English, and I thank you. Um, I want to start with this conversation or this concept of Black Start. Uh, in the program, it describes it as to restart or restore power. And what I think is interesting about this is, at least in English, power has a lovely double meaning that we focus on a lot in our work on energy democracy, which is that it's not just power in terms of electricity production, but it's also power in terms of generating the political will to get things done. And I think it's important to think of this Black Start as a way to not only restart the way that we think about the energy system, but to restart who's in charge of the energy system and who's making the decisions for the energy system. I thought about a lot, this a lot uh, earlier, uh, sorry, yesterday. I had the pleasure of just taking a quick walk when I arrived in the afternoon up through old San Juan, and I was reminded, uh, ironically, of a video game I played as a kid called Pirates, where you could sail around the Caribbean and participate in exploiting uh, on behalf of the colonial powers different places and I have no doubt that as I walked past the fort there echoes of this video game were coming up in my head as, uh, as, as participating in this colonial exercise uh, but those lessons uh, uh, the lesson from that was that the colonial history from that dates back 500 years is to some extent still with us I realize I don't have the clicker so I don't know if someone who does wants to advance my slide for me thank you Yes, that's there, okay. Big green button. <laughs> yes, fabulous. So there are, there are four different elements, and I won't read through all of them necessarily, uh, 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 of colonial history that still impacts the conversation that we're having about energy today. It was the last federally appointed governor who during the process of nationalizing the utility decided that we would give away electricity to municipalities, something that cost every Puerto Rican electricity customer over $100 in 2016. There's um, the end of the federal tax incentives for manufacturing on the island that led to a decades-long economic downturn. And then, of course, there's the now sort of infamous federal uh, policy, PROMESA, and the Federal Oversight Board taking away local self-determination over the financial control of the island uh, and some proposals to uh, do some very significant changes to the tax system in order to pay back hedge fund creditors. And there's a fair amount of evidence as well, uh, just in some of the research that I've done in, in order to come here and speak with you about the fact that some of that debt may have been illegally taken out and not need to all be repaid. So that's all to say that I think that when we talk about Black Start, we need to start back a lot further than just what happened with Hurricane Maria or what's been happening with PREPA over the past decade, but rather start back a lot further in terms of the underlying uh, circumstances of the situation. The second thing I wanted to address is this discussion about privatization. Um, we at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance are always focused on the notion of how do we maintain uh, local control and ownership over the various systems that we work on throughout the economy, energy and in many other ways. And I think that there are sort of three key terms that privatization is meant to address, and we've discussed many of them today. One of them is reliability, people just having access to reliable electricity. Resiliency, uh, but I think mostly accountability uh, is this really uh, important element. And, and you've already taken great steps around accountability with the Energy Commission, now the Energy Bureau, overseeing PREPA, making sure that the resource planning uh, is being done in a responsible manner, making sure um, that the utility is being a better steward of public resources. And it's not perfect, I don't mean to imply that, nor is it sufficient, nor is it enough for the changes that need to happen, um, but there have already been steps made. 
And I think the danger with privatization, number one, is that the private sector doesn't necessarily do it better. One of the largest investor-owned utilities in the country, Pacific Gas and Electric, recently declared bankruptcy because its operations in California were extremely vu vulnerable to climate-induced threats like wildfires and the accumulated liability of its high-voltage transmission infrastructure being impacted by wildfires uh, has put that company into bankruptcy. I would add also, though, that it was competition from community-owned uh, utilities under their Community Choice Program that, it, that added to that pressure. Um, that's not to say that we disagree with the notion of having competition in a market that is properly regulated, that gives everybody a chance to participate. Many people have already mentioned, though, that there's a lot of inequity in the ability of people to participate. Many people who might, for example, already have solar and a battery uh, have the financial means to do so, and many of the residents of the island would not. So I think that's a, an important uh, principle to keep in mind. And the final thing I would say about privatization is simply that there is going to be an upside in the transition to renewable energy. There are economic benefits to be had. There are financial uh, opportunities in transitioning to renewables, and with privatization, you are you are selling those off. As well as you're selling the assets, now you're selling off the future benefits. So think carefully about the potential downside as well as the potential upside. There's a couple of things I want to talk about other than just sort of the power and the accountability in the system, and that's some, two of the important principles that we focus on that give us the opportunity to have more local ownership and control. And I apologize, I like complicated charts and graphs. We do a lot of energy policy research. I won't get too much into how these work, but just suffice to say that what this is meant to show you is that solar uh, is less expensive as you build it larger, which you may already know, but that it actually competes very well at any size, and that's because large solar doesn't compete against small solar, uh, and this is true across all other kinds of renewable energy. You can read about it more in some reports that we've published on our website. But um, when you compare, for example, the cost of generating solar on a residential rooftop, on a business scale rooftop, and at small utility scale, all of those things are much less than the price of the competition, the price that's provided by the, uh, the incumbent utility company, and as represented by the dotted lines. And so the idea here is that we can produce at any scale. And why is that important? Because when we are able to produce at a small scale, we also get other benefits we don't get at large scale. For example, Cross Border did an interesting study a couple of years ago. Uh, it was as part of a regulatory proceeding in Arizona, and they looked at the value of the local spending. When you put solar on a rooftop, you hire local companies. You might take out a loan from a local credit union. There are all sorts of ancillary benefits that come along with making that investment. It's a similar thing to, for example, shopping at a local independent business versus shopping at a Walmart. There's nothing wrong with either of those things, but more of the dollar you spend at that local business stays in the local economy. And if you add that together with that analysis of the cost of solar, uh, which is what you see on the right-hand side of the slide, and, you sort of, and if you're looking at this from the perspective of how to retain most of that wealth from doing local renewable energy, you subtract out that local, energy, that local spending value from the cost of solar, and you can see that building at a small scale is not only cost-effective against the cost of energy from the utility company, it's also even as cost-effective as many larger-scale opportunities for generating energy because you're keeping more of that dollar in the community, and that's very important. Scale is also important, of course, because it enables ownership, and ownership is what leads to more of the economic benefits of renewable energy, whether that's from jobs or from the overall economic impact where those dollars are spent, in the same way that we have local spending. If you can have community ownership of a project, um, you can also keep more of those economic benefits local. I think the other thing I want to say about this that's important in, the, in this context of scale and ownership is that you can build things at a small scale and still do big things. We did an analysis a few years ago comparing uh, solar deployment in Germany to solar deployment in the United States, and we picked similar five-year periods in each economy's development of solar. And what we found is that both deployed about the same amount of solar over that time period. It was something like 20,000 megawatts. But in Germany, the average size of a solar installation was about one-tenth the size it was in the United States because most of the solar that was developed in Germany is community-owned. They now have over 30,000 megawatts of renewable energy that's owned by cooperatives, individuals, small businesses. And so we can get to scale. We can solve the big problems that we have with climate, with transitioning to renewable energy, and do it at a small size. The last thing I want to leave you with is a story um, about the Shiloh Temple Community Solar Project in Minnesota, because I think it's a good story of what can happen when we've gotten the rules right 
to allow for the kind of development that we want to see happen with our energy system. The Shiloh Temple is a church in North Minneapolis, a disproportionately poor area of the city, a disproportionately high uh, number of people of color. Uh, the project provides energy to the church as well as energy to many other participants who are members of the church or members in the community, but it's also cooperatively owned which means that all of the financial benefit from that project, any profits go back to those subscribers. And it means that they were able to make choices such as hiring more of the workforce that developed that project from within the own, their own community. You can see I got a little logo for our podcast. We did a podcast interview as well as a short video about this project if you're interested in learning more about it. Uh, it's on our website. So I just want to leave you with this notion that it really is about how you structure the rules for the system that enable you to get the outcomes that you want. So to think carefully about who has the power in the system and where has that power been, been before and how do you want to change that. To think about what decisions you're making now that set up the accountability for the systems that you want and to make sure that scale and ownership are key pieces of the decision-making process going forward uh, because they enable things like energy democracy and allow communities to make the choices for themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Next up, we have Roy Torber, principal at the Islands Energy Program of the Rocky Mountain Institute. Shortly after Hurricanes Irma and Maria, Rocky Mountain partnered with the Institute for Competitiveness and Sustainable Economy to support a new vision for Puerto Rico's energy system. He joins us today to teach us how policy in Puerto Rico can emphasize renewable energy and how the integration of new storage and generation technologies can get us there. Ladies and gentlemen, Roy Turbert. Okay. I don't know where I'm going. Thank you, Rosanna. When I hear, Thank when you I hear my name from where you go. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. In 1976, Amory Lovins, the co-founder of Rocky Mountain Institute, published a seminal paper called Soft Energy Paths. In it, he posited the rather radical idea that instead of the Instead of the large investment decisions that energy leaders globally had been making in oil and gas development, large-scale nuclear, in major highways, in high-voltage transmission, in coal-fired power plants, there was a soft energy path that said close to the customer solutions like energy efficiency, distributed energy resources like solar on rooftops, multimodal transportation, that this was the pathway for the United States and globally to take. And I'd say in the decades that have come, uh, we've seen him often proved right, that there is a cheaper way than to save billions in this next big investment. And so really I think of, of my team here in the Caribbean and, and all of our RMI's work as fighting against these systemic biases towards the big, simple, capital-heavy decision. Here in Puerto Rico, and, and my work over the past few years has really focused in Puerto Rico, I see those biases at play quite strongly. Um, I'll, I'll really focus a lot of this on two of those biases, how policy and new technology can help overcome them. One is that these new resources are often not considered. We've seen in the draft of the integrated resource plan put, put forward by PREPA that there is no mention really of wind energy. It is dismissed largely. Uh, distributed energy storage, so batteries in households, largely ignored. Solar, although considered at the, at the bulk scale, at the far more household and microgrid scale is not truly considered. That's an example of consideration. The second bias is against fully valuing the benefits of these far more flexible resources. Um, I, I've, I've flown here from uh, Bahamas and the Turks and Caicos. I have, a, I have a fairly nice travel schedule as I work with 15 different islands across the Caribbean, although mostly here in Puerto Rico. And I understand some of this. I met with utilities, and what they often talk about is we want uh, push-button functionality. What does that mean? That means uh, you, you can go to the actual generator and you push the button and it turns on and gives you as much power as you need. And they say, okay, if you're going to have all these households and these batteries scatter across the system, where is the single button that I can push to get the power I need? So I absolutely understand some of that bias. But I do think to pick up a theme from, from this morning, this is the core question facing Puerto Rico. If not gas as our transition fuel, if not all those infrastructure, the import terminals, the pipelines, if not a big multi-billion dollar investment, then what's our alternative? And I'll just briefly offer some of the, the answer that we see, which is a combination of quickly developing large-scale renewables, wind, solar, 
supported by battery energy storage, particularly of the lithium ion chemistry. Secondly, that should be from the, from the gr grassroots up with microgrids and community participation and rooftop solar. That should be the, the primary underpinning of that transition. But you also need to do smart things around energy efficiency and what we call demand flexibility. So the ability to change exactly what the system is demanding, let's say at an hour where your solar has dipped off because of a, a big cloud or a major storm system. That flexibility really reduces the amount of battery energy storage. Uh, we do need to continue using some fossil fuels in this transition time, but we have far more generation than we need here in Puerto Rico. The problem really is that it is inflexible. It's disproportionately in the south. It's very costly. It's locally polluting. Diesel and heavy and, and bunker fuel, the, the natural gas and the coal systems that each you know are, are, are a major proportion of energy generation at the moment. Diesel and the, and the bunker fuel oil is going to be the first to phase out. But you can do that very quickly with renewables as the major backstop, with some efficiency improvements to existing uh, fossil fuel assets like the diesel to use them as an, in this intervening time. You don't have to jump into the, the LNG uh, ship that I think is somewhere in the lobby, and we know there's a conference happening below us at the, at the very moment. So there is an alternative path there. Thank you. The other piece that honestly brings this urgency is climate change. Climate change is our collective moral imperative. I will point out that the, the Hurricane Maria that, that hit here in a devastating way last week in Mozambique with another deadly typhoon, these are not isolate, isolated incidents. And so we, we also heard, heard mention this morning of the resilience elements of solar. And Anderson Cooper asked, well, is it, is it really more resilient? And that's something I'll also speak a bit to of the ability to have these small systems also create a system that will be prepared for what could be a very distressing and dangerous time for many islands uh, ac across the world. So let's get into it. Uh, first is just a bit of context. Unsurprisingly, uh, many of you will have seen a lot of this data that the Puerto Rico lags behind the continental United States in the employment picture, in GDP growth. The energy sector is increasingly a drag and, and creating those conditions for uh, employers to move their jobs elsewhere and for the recovery to be far slower. You also see in this other chart that the, the weather-related disruptions to the grid, the reason that um, you know, your power might go out for a few hours, which happens far too frequently, is increasingly due to weather. And that's a, a, a threat that is, that is bound to grow as weather becomes more extreme. In this honestly distressing challenge, we do see some opportunities. Uh, We've heard from many across Puerto Rico and, and with our partners, ICSE and others, um, helped to convene some of these multi-stakeholder work that a new type of collaboration is possible. Because of the trauma of Maria, stakeholders will work across the aisle and across you know, frayed relationships that didn't work before. But this is now possible and we've seen very positive policy emerge from that and we're very encouraged with the progress of 1121 but also the incredibly important regulatory agenda that comes after it. That for us is only step one. There needs to be this community-led, bottom-up, continued drive for adopting renewables that needs to be encouraged. There shouldn't be any barriers put to it. That, that is really now economically possible because of new technology that I'll speak a bit about. But lastly, the, the, these assets, the investments, are, are profitable for a community to do it, for a new investor to do it. There's a lot of, of room for making money. And it's not only making money for the, the, the folks outside, but in the end, it leads to a lower cost system for Puerto Ricans. And that, to me, is the, is the underlying benefit that we should be pursuing because of that, of that chart that shows the depressed economy in Puerto Rico really suffering from a, a, a quite poor energy system. On this question of are, are these new assets, uh, solar panels, wind turbines, truly more resilient? We'd point out, and, and I, we commissioned a team across the Caribbean to do an exact study on this. Um, they can be, but they are not necessarily. So what we found across the Caribbean is some uh, solar systems failed. We have a photo here of a, of a largely destroyed solar system, and some survived up to category five impacts. And we, the engineers really went and tore apart a lot of systems and got into the deep details, but found some, some answers that have now led to a set of design recommendations. They are around the foundations, around the fasteners used, the bolts, 
And then a lot of issues found just in terms of you didn't have a, someone checking on the commissioning of the system to make sure that all the bolts were fully tightened down. And then when the, the winds came along, it rips off one solar panel and the whole chain fails. So that, for us, speaks to this idea that if we are going to continue on this pathway, it has to be a set of systems that are not only low cost. Low cost only gets us part of the way there. They have to be resilient to the storms that are getting ever more severe. And so now we have built some Category 5 certified solar systems in St. Vincent and elsewhere in the region. So this is, this is technically possible. It's just a matter of doing it right. On two technologies I'll speak a little bit about. Don't, don't feel like you have to pour too much into that complicated chart. Um, this, this concept of flexibility, for me, is a way of overcoming one of the biases in the system to say we need that single big investment. No, actually the answer is you can get flexibility out of a few investments you might make. One of those technologies, energy efficiency, and the other battery storage work particularly well together. When I say energy efficiency, I mean not only the manufacturer's responsibility to keep making a better light bulb, I mean the designer, the architect, and the engineers working in the building to select the right amount of lighting, to put in the pr appropriate controls, which in the end can have a, a less added heat effect, right? More light bulbs always turned on, you have more heat, you need more air conditioning, all of this is the way we think about efficiency as a whole system. If you can find ways to reduce efficiency, you can reduce your total capital costs across the system. Um, the next phase we see is very exciting for efficiency is what we call demand flexibility. And simply put, that is the communication of, let's say, a set of water heaters across Puerto, Puerto Rico to say, when the grid really needs a little bit less power being demanded, all the water heaters can shift their set points by just a degree or two. The power there is in having all the devices now connected working together. That's the sort of flexibility that we haven't had in our grids anywhere in the world, but Puerto Rico has the conditions to really be a true leader and thereby reduce the total amount of battery energy storage that's needed. And so most folks, particularly with the, the cost declines thanks to, to cell phones and and batteries and now electric vehicles. Most folks on storage think immediately about lithium ion. And we'd point out that's one of many technologies that can serve this battery storage problem for islands and other grids that are gonna have far more and more renewables that are not consistent across a day or a month. But if we look deeply at, at a battery, once you have it in your system, it provides you a, a multitude of values. So Black Start, the name of the conference, is also one of the benefits of a battery. Uh, but secondly, right now, uh, elsewhere in Puerto Rico, you have what you call spinning reserve. That is your fossil fuel assets ready to provide power at a moment's notice. A battery does that without burning any fuel. Batteries, when put in the right part of the system, can help avoid new costly distribution investments or transmission investments. So all, that's three of 13 benefits of these batteries that we quantify. To be clear, you can't, you can't get them all at once. The battery can only be doing certain thing at once, but once you've paid for it, it has the flexibility to provide you multiple of those benefits over time. And so when you start to, to price, and this is again the importance of the regulator, when you start to price the true benefits of these new distributed systems, you begin to unlock and untap their ability to transform the grid. We see policy as one of the enabling factors, but really now the major onus is on PREP and their forthcoming regulations to help untap this market. That for us is, is one of the, the main top priorities. I, I want to keep this as simple as I can, and so if you really boil it all down, there needs to be a clear vision with bottom-up participation that reflects the priorities of the community, but that needs to come through in policy and utility planning. Secondly, you need uh, support to the regulator, not only budgetary support, but giving them the expertise they need on the, the policy topic, I interpreting the, the new policy guidance into a set of regulations from the IRP to Wheeling to net metering, to, to any, any tariff design that might, might occur in the near term. That for us creates the, the certainty of this pathway and really does empower that, that really important entity. But lastly, the, the projects have to happen. There's a skepticism that we keep hearing. Will these projects scale? Is it really gonna take off? The only proof will happen if we can expedite projects that are beneficial for the grid, lower cost for customers, that are deeply a, adopted by their communities. That's how, the, how these these efforts get momentum. I've personally seen this working in St. Lucia and uh, Belize and St. Vincent and the Grenadines and many others of that the first few projects, people start to change their perception of, okay, it is really possible. We can get behind it. The young engineers are saying, 
this is where I see my future. I want to be trained in this. Um, I'd point out that you know, the, the disparities are, are numerous, but as this chart clearly shows, the, the, the budget and funding for the regulator here in Puerto Rico is a fraction of any other jurisdiction. And that, I think, is something the Senate Bill 1121 aims to address, and we're, very, we're pleased to see that. I will leave all of you with a thank you. Um, this work requires many. It, it, is, it is truly one of those problems that requires civil society and government, community organizers, and, and many others to work together. And we've seen that be incredibly powerful here in Puerto Rico. So I'm very pleased to be a, a small part of a growing movement. Thank you all. Thank you, Roy. Up next is Professor Jeffrey Heal. Mr. Heer is a, a professor at Columbia Business School. His remarks will focus on renewable resources and integrating resiliency into Puerto Rico's energy grid in the face of climate change. Please put your hands together for Jeffrey Heal. Thank you. <coughs> um, in addition to having a day job in New York, I actually have a house here in Puerto Rico, and I spend quite a lot of my time down in Puerto Rico. So I have personal <coughs> experience of some of the frustrations of dealing with the energy system here, uh, and in particular post-Hurricane post Maria. Uh, we've heard a lot about the transition from fossil fuels to renewables. I'm an economist. I want to focus in on the economics of transitions from fossil fuels to renewables. Um, so this diagram, this, this chart here gives you some information about the basic economics of the popular renewables, the popular fossil fuels. Um, wind, solar, gas, and coal. And on the right-hand side there, you've got the, uh, the cost of producing a megawatt hour of electricity from each of those sources. So wind, you can produce a megawatt hour. This is, this is actually, this is for the continental United States at the moment. Um, wind, you can produce a megawatt hour for about $30. Uh, solar, about $36. Gas, uh, a combined cycle gas plant, an efficient combined cycle gas plant will cost you about $41, and coal, $60 and upwards. So you can see that in the sort of mainland United States, uh, the cheapest ways of producing electric power at the moment are wind and solar. Uh, they undercut gas and they undercut coal quite considerably. Um, but that hasn't always been true. This shows you sort of historical data on these costs. On the vertical axis, you've got the cost of power. Uh, on the horizontal axis, you've got years from 2009 to 2017. Uh, what is in the, the lowest line there, the bottom line, the blue line, is the cost of producing power from wind. You can see it's come down steadily over time, and it's the lowest cost source of wind, so source of power in the continental US at the moment. What is interesting is the line which starts at the top left and comes down to almost the bottom right. That's the cost of solar power. Uh, and solar power is now, as I said just a, just a couple of minutes ago, the second least expensive way of producing electricity in the United States. But that's only been true for the last two or three years. So it's only in the last two or three years that wind and solar have undercut fossil fuels. Uh, then you can see the cost of gas, uh, which is more than the cost of wind or solar, and the cost of coal, which is significantly higher again. These numbers again reply, apply to the uh, continental United States. These are averaged over the whole of the continental United States. Uh, prices vary from place to place depending on a range of conditions. Uh, so you can see for the last two or three years, wind and solar have been on average the least expensive ways of producing electric power in the US. But just from a straightforward economic cost perspective, uh, it makes sense to switch away from fossil fuels and towards them. Um, now this is the continental United States. Conditions down here are slightly different. Uh, the cost of gas down here, for example, is a lot higher than it is in the continental United States. You have to import it as LNG. The cost of LNG is at least twice the cost of regular gas in the US. Um, and you have to import coal again. The cost of transporting coal by ship is again, again very high. Uh, so the cost of coal and gas and the producing power from cost of coal and gas down here are significantly higher than they are in the US. Um, you also, have, of course, have to pay to import turbines and import solar panels. But to offset that, the cost of power from solar sources actually drops as the intensity of insulation rises. So here you're at a lower latitude. The sun is stronger. It shines for more hours per day. Uh, and actually, that reduces the cost of solar power. Um, the cost of solar power actually falls systematically 
as you go to lower latitudes, you get stronger, st stronger radiation from the sun. So the cost of solar power will be lower here than it is in the, the US. The cost of wind depends on the intensity of the wind and the cont continuity of the wind. And again, with trade winds in this part of the world, uh, you have very favorable conditions for producing power from wind. So the cost of power from wind is roughly the same as it is in the best places in the US. So the, the cost differential uh, between fossil fuels and wind and solar is strongly in favor of wind and solar, uh, in, in Puerto Rico in particular, and the Caribbean in general. Um, now, the, um, the problem with solar and wind, obviously, is you can't rely on them totally, because you'll have to, there'll be times when you don't have any power at all. Uh, the obvious way of dealing with that intermittency is to talk about batteries, and we've heard a lot of discussion of the role of batteries. So I'll, talk about, so I'll tell you a little bit about the economics of batteries and how that's changed. If you look at the diagram here, the downward sloping line gives you the cost of a unit of storage from a, a lithium-ion battery. It's the cost of a, a kilowatt hour of storage out of a lithium-ion battery. It starts at $3,000 a kilowatt hour, and it's down now to about $200 a kilowatt hour. That's fallen by a factor of more than 10 over the last couple of decades, and it's still falling, uh, still falling quite rapidly. The output sloping line, the orange line, shows you the energy density of lithium ion batteries. It shows you how many kilowatt hours you can get in a kilogram, uh, how big your battery has to be, how heavy it has to be. And energy density has gone up by a factor of roughly three. Uh, so batteries can be now one third of the size that they were 20 years back, and they cost one tenth of what they cost 20 years back. Uh, and that progress is continuing. So we can expect to see batteries getting smaller and cheaper over the next decade or so. Uh, this is some data from Bloomberg, uh, which shows what's happening on you know, the battery front in a little bit more detail. Um, the cost of batteries, as I said, was $3,000 for a kilowatt hour a, a couple of decades back. It's now down to last year $176 a kilowatt hour. And according to Elon Musk, uh, Tesla will be selling batteries for $100 a kilowatt hour later next year. Uh, either at the end of this year or early next year. Um, <clears throat> but $100 a kilowatt hour, battery storage is a very competitive way of smoothing out the intermittent output from wind and solar. You can afford to build batteries which are big enough to store many days of output and act to, to smooth out the output and, and essentially make solar and wind dispatchable. So the economics of batteries and the economics of solar and wind has transformed radically in the last five or six years and is continuing to transform in a highly favorable direction. Now there's one slight catch from an economic perspective in all of this good news. And that's that um, wind and solar and batteries have a different uh, financial profile from, uh, from, from fossil fuels. All the capital costs, all the costs are capital costs and they all have to be paid up front. Uh, so you know, if you look at, take out, for example, a typical gas-fired power station, you pay roughly 40% up front, which is the capital cost, and then 60% of the cost, the lifetime cost of that, you pay as fuel costs and operating costs over the life of the plant. Uh, if you take a solar power station backed up by batteries, you pay for it all up front. You've paid everything before it starts to generate a single kilowatt hour of electricity. So it's in some sense more capital intensive. More capital investment is needed up front. Um, and that's a challenge for a situation like, like Puerto Rico, uh, which is in, in the middle of a financial crisis. Um, you have to find more money up front, uh, and then we're talking about extra billions of dollars up front. That's clearly not something that PREPA is well-placed to deal with at the moment. Um, so a prerequisite for taking advantage of the, the lower costs of, of, of uh, solar and wind and batteries is going to be finding a way of financing this. And you know, one possibility, obviously, would be to privatize some of the system, uh, move the kind of situation you have, for example, back in New York, uh, where the grid is managed essentially by the state, uh, but the production of power is privatized. You have independent power producers, and then anybody can come in, set up a power station and produce power and bid it into the grid. Uh, if you had independent, if you had a system like that of independent power producers here in Puerto Rico, then there'd be a, an incentive for private capital to come in and meet some of those capital costs required to set the system up in the first place. Um, so, just to summarize there, are, you know, economically, it makes a lot of sense to transit from fossil fuels uh, to renewable energy, quite independently of any environmental benefits there might be. Uh, at the same time, there's a financial challenge there, and we have to rethink the regulatory and financial framework in order to be able to bring in sufficient capital to make this all work early on. Thank you very much.
off the street for about 100 days. So when I showed up yesterday to check into the hotel, I, I didn't know if I should say welcome home or I should say uh, what happened to the place that I was at. Things have changed. This was not the place I saw, by the way. If you were here to, and, uh, towards the end of 2017 and towards the early 2018, this was a sea of people. And they were not as good looking as you, by the way. Um, in tables, representing the entire government of the, of the Puerto Rico government and the federal government as well, too. And it was mayhem. Due to maybe lack of planning, lack of policies, lack of engineering. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, in my little talk here. And I'm not going to give you 10,000 slides, but I'll definitely cover the most important aspects. I'm an engineer, so I'll talk to the facts. We'll talk some from vision to practicality, which is, I think, at the end of the day, as a Puerto Rican citizen or somebody who really cares about this island uh, would really um, value more than anything else. I, I, let me see if I can press this slide. So we we'll talk about Puerto Rico, by the way, and I don't know how many of you have seen the actual grid. This is just the transmission side of Puerto Rico. This is not the distribution, which is looks more like the uh, capillaries in your body. This is basically the arteries of your body, and the, the, uh, the plants are basically the uh, hearts pumping out, in this case, power instead of blood into the system. I, I'm a civil engineer, by the way. I am not an electrical engineer. I had to study this until I became an electrical engineer. I never believed that um, there was so much information in that little map. And I, I was not sure how many people on this, in this island knew about this map until I heard people say, when is line 51000 going to repair so I can get power to my home? I don't think anybody in the US knows what line powers their home. But in Puerto Rico, they surely do. That's how important this is to this island. There was some talk about generation. And people talk about generation being in the south, people being in the north. There's a lot of things behind that. Not everything that you heard or in papers is actually true. Because they said that the south was because generation industrialized is going to be in the south. That's true. But in the 1990s, that wasn't the case. But the Cortico and the PPG were located in the south, had already left the island. In the 1990s, the reason for the generation to be developed in the south was because in the north, it wasn't light. People were against the generation in the north for a lot of reasons. Land also was more expensive than the land in the south. So we got to take all this into account. We're all part of this problem and part of this solution as well, too. So what did I uh, saw, see in the Puerto Rico? Kenneth mentioned quantity, location, sources, and quality of, of the power being an important aspect of this. I couldn't agree with him more. When I saw the island, flew in here nine days after the storm. September 29, at 8 a.m., I'm flying in on Air Force Two. When I land here, it, it made me cry. Puerto Rico was no, not what I remembered as a kid. I grew up just a few miles from here, and um, I was always, yes, I knew that the power was not very reliable, by the way. If anybody is from Puerto Rico knows that their alarm clock has to be reset at about every month. Because at least one time in that month, that power is going to go out. That tells you something. The system was never, ever that reliable. There was always problems with it. So operations and maintenance was what I saw. Issues with that. The, the um, different lines, when I flew the lines in the helicopter, landed two days later, I'm told, I'm asked, when do you think this is going to be restored? And at that time, when my friend is here, Ricardo Ramos and I, we talked a lot about that. The answer was, it's going to take a while. It took over 50 years to build the system. We had to fix it in months. Over 62,000 poles were installed. Almost 2 million mi uh, feet of line were re reinstalled. Over uh, 10,000 transformers were installed. Over 300 of the... Um, Distribution systems um, centers were also impacted by this. This was a mammoth um, undertaking for anybody, much more or less for a company who is 
on a $9 billion bankruptcy issue at the time. By the way, do you know the materials, some of the materials were sold before the storm hit? So why? Because of the economic situation. So how do you restore power after a storm when you don't have even the materials to do it? Over $280 million worth of materials were purchased for this um, repair, all using a Defense Procurement Act, which meant no manufacturer in the U.S. could sell to somebody that line, that transformer, before selling it to me. That was that important. But even with that, it took a long time, way too long. Oh, so where are we and we go from here? The, the recovery challenged several things. Generation was number one, we were not in charge of that. I'll tell you why. There's a thing called the Staffer Act which is the, the act that tells the law that gives me the power to come over here and do some restoration on behalf of the federal government. But that act also prevents me from building a better, more resilient system. So if you want to talk about legislation and law, that's something that needs to be changed. If there is an emergency operation, I could only restore things as they were, as it is. Because, and I'm going to be totally brutally honest here, a farmer in the middle of Arkansas does not care for a new power pole for a citizen in Puerto Rico. So how do we change that? How do we change the, the message to understand that we're all in this together and this impacts not only the Puerto Rico economy, but the mainland economy as well too. When we started restoring power, we discovered that there were underground wires. There's a lot of underground wires here in San Juan, 115 kilowatt. Uh, kilovolt wires if you want to know but it costs 10 times more to put a w one wire under on the ground than it is on the air 10 times so this is not a simple thing we got to go at, at it in a pretty smart way I like to talk about microgrids I love to talk about the solar panels for communities let me give you something in the engineering side Tesla came over and talked to me he said, hey, we can install solar panels and batteries for people and people's homes. I said, okay, that's great. How much power? About 4,000 watts per home. Oh, wow, 4,000. You know what you guys spend in your homes in Puerto Rico? You're more in the 7,000, 8,000 watt level. Why? Because we all love the air conditioner running all the time. We love the TV and this and that and that and that. So it's a cultural problem too. I love the solutions, but you gotta also influence the culture and the change in behavior of the people. So by the way, that system of 4,000 was $7,000 per household. So 100,000 households, $7 billion. We have over 3 million people living in Puerto Rico. That's not an easy solution. So, we got to bring that into, how do we manage this? How do we actually make this happen? Let me give you another example. Culebra. That line of Culebra right now is running on a generator that we install. Diesel, fueling it. Since um, the October, November timeline. Why? Because it depends on the power line that goes underneath the water, starts from Puerto Rico, goes to Vieques, and from Vieques goes to Culebra. Power line was actually vandalized coming out of Puerto Rico. It was not the hurricane. But then the line in Vieques was destroyed by the hurricane. That actually passes by a wetland, by the way, which we need regulatory permits, environmental permits to be able to go into that line and repair it. And then give power to Culebra. It's a little bit more complicated one than what people might understand. But the reason why Culebra has power is because the people in Culebra really stepped up to the plate. They took care of cleaning up and taking care of the island itself so that we were ready to receive power. We went in there, put the generators, and in a matter of three days, they had power. And after we installed the generators. That is key. So when we talk about um, the system, the system is about the people. And I am a believer that not one solution is, 
it's the uh, golden or the silver bullet in this. I believe we're in a hybrid approach. I believe there's a transition period going from fossil fuels to renewables. I love that approach. But I believe the approach is going to take a little longer than that might be expected, just because there's a behavioral component attached to it as well. Um, to close out, I would say Puerto Rico has to have everybody in it together. Communication piece was also key during, during my presence here. People were all over the place asking questions, what's going on, what's happening, we're getting this information from the state, we're getting this information from the federal government, we're getting this other information from a buddy of mine. Which, by the way, the buddy of mine in Puerto Rico is a lot more reliable than the government, according to the people. Why? I even saw it. In Facebook, the person who had the most amount of information in Facebook was an ex-employee from PREPA. Not PREPA. Not the state government. Actually, the most viewed person in Puerto Rico in information was the helicopter pilot from FURA. I, was, I did a Facebook Live with him, and I couldn't believe he had over 100,000 people look, watching the video at one point. That's amazing. But that also tells you where the trust level is of the people of Puerto Rico. And in order to create change, you need to have trust. Thank you for that. Thank you, Jose. Our next speaker is a respected engineer and planner from Puerto Rico. Mr. Tomas Torres is the executive director of the Institute of Competitiveness and Sustainable Economy, and now, most recently, the consumer representative in PREPA's board. He has been intimately involved in the efforts for gradual transformation of PREPA. Mr. Torres Plaga will guide us through PREPA's long, complicated history and take us into the current long-term planning process. Welcome, Tomas. Gracias. Se oye. Un honor estar aquí con ustedes. ¿Comieron bien? Parece que no. Si me pueden habilitar la presentación, comenzamos rapidito. Parece que no quiere, pero en lo que la ponen. No. 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 Ahí estamos. The ICSE, or ICSE, as we usually know it, is a nonprofit public interest organization. We propel change. And we do it through education and capacity building. In fact, we uh, not only were part, but we kind of were the the engine behind important things are the public collaborative, like we did with uh, Rocky Mountain, uh, Roy Tolbert. And uh, a very important article that we published before the collaborative with the Institute for Economic Analysis, and uh, known as AIFA, which basically propelled a great uh, deal of discussion nationwide. And basically is what we do. Our first project is the transformation of the electric system of Puerto Rico. And Jose already showed this uh, picture, but this is how our system will look in the Black Star. We had 31,500 miles, circuit miles of distribution. You know how long is that? It's a flight from here to LA round trip four times, plus one leg and a little bit more. The yellow lines are the 4,000 volt lines that you see. They are mostly in, in San Juan, Mayagüez, Ponce, and some other metro areas. The blue line are the 8,000 volts line that are in the mountain center area. And the pink line are the 13 volts line that this is the new system that PREPA is installing in order to have kind of a standard 13,000 volt distribution system. This is our transmission system, 2,400 miles. Many people after the hurricane told me, Tomas, in Puerto Rico, you need to have a loop to be more 
reliant, resilient. We have a loop. We don't only have a loop, but we have cables that go from north to south on the island. The problem is that the generation in Puerto Rico, as we can see here, although spread it throughout the island, currently today are produced on the south, are mainly produced in, in the AES plant in Guayama, in the Aguirre Prepa plant on the south, in Costa Sur plant, and the uh, Ecoelectrica plant. We also have gas turbines throughout the island, including some turbines in Vieques and Culebras. Prepa's own generation capacity is about 4,000 700 megawatts, plus a thousand megawatts from uh, AES and Equelectrica. Now, let's talk about my favorite subject, metrics. We had some very difficult time during Maria, but why was that? Because something was happening before. There is three important metrics I would like to discuss with you. The first one is the safety. We know, we know it as safety, what safety means, that's funny name, safety. Well, safety is the frequency of which power outages occur. As you can see on the right-hand side of the column, the nation value for the American Public Power Association is one. We have one main outage a year. That is the national average for the public utilities in the U.S. In Puerto Rico, we got almost 12 and everybody before Maria lived, lived that experience. For a total amount of eight outages of 16 hours per year, that is the SADI matrix, and KD, the duration, is about 180 minutes. And nationwide, is about an hour a year for an, a little bit more of an hour of a duration. After Maria, we broke this scale. I, I remember being in panels and say that in Puerto Rico we have a safety of 365 because every day we have a power outage. But we, are, we need to reconstruct our system in a one that is resilient. But we need to take care of something first, and that is debt. What you're seeing here is the numbers of the PREPA financial statement, the last one released before bankruptcy. Basically, I'll tell you that by that time, 2014, PREPA has some assets of $10.3 billion, has some capital assets of $6.8 billion, and has a debt of $9.4 billion. Debt to asset ratio was, one, was 0.91. Basically, that is insolvency, because one is insolvency in debt to asset ratio. When you consider only the capital asset, that ratio increases almost to 1.4. How that compare with national values? Well, tell you very simply, 0.5. As for APPA, the average of debt to assets is 0.5. Not only APPA, but also in the Edison Institute, which is the organization that grouped the investor-owned utilities in the U.S., is 0.55. That means that in order to be a sustainable utility towards the future, the relation of debt to asset is half. If you have asset of $5 billion, your debt should be between 2 $2.5 billion. This is, these pictures were part of an article that I published. I was honored to publish in Public Utility Fortnightly. It's a nationwide fortnightly since 1912 in the U.S. And when I sent those pictures, I remember talking to my friend Steve, the editor. He told me, Tomas, send me pictures, recent pictures, not re pictures on the middle of the hurricane. And I say, Steve, those pictures were taken last week. This picture, if you can see, is a pole on the middle of the street. This is there right now in Gurao, Puerto Rico, in the middle of the street. The other is the typical distribution system in our urban centers throughout Puerto Rico, where it's very fragile. You have wooden poles. You have transformers that are aging and, and lines that 
well, that persists like we say here, una tormenta platanera, a weak storm. So we need to change. This is a system that we currently have where we have utilities, public, private utilities, central utilities that generate energy and transmit one way direction to our cities and towns and in the cities and towns that energy is distributed to the end user. This is what we need. We need a new model. We need to go to the future of energy in Puerto Rico. A future of multiple flows where we don't only have an assist, a, a modern utility that have multiple supply sources that have wind, that have solar, that has battery storage, but also like Senator Batia and Senator Hammer told this morning, we have the prosumer that in our urban centers and towns, we can produce energy. By who? By you, the consumer. The consumer can produce energy integrated into the grid, and we have multiple flows. So the energy that you produce, your neighbor can use. If not, on the next town, it can be used. And what is the, the importance of this? Well, renewables doesn't need fuel. In economics, that means that marginal cost is zero or close to zero, right? And as fixed cost decreases, that means that the issue of our electrical system and electrical systems on the world in the future will not be the generation of energy, but the use of energy, like in telecom, where your voice and your da data doesn't cost. The important thing about the communication systems are the wires. And the future of energy is the wires. That is the future. We need a base in order to reach that immediate future. And I extensively discussed this morning, that is Senate Bill 1121. We were part of the Senate Advisory Committee in conjunction with Rocky Mountain, Reimagina, the Colegio de Ingenieros, and also the uh, legal school of the University of Puerto Rico, Professor Luis Aníbal Aviles, which is here today. And we did a report. We spent about four to five months trying to get the modern turn, trends, technology, to feed the Senate to do a law that fit that future. And the result was Bill 1121. That bill shall be passed and need to be passed in order to Puerto Rico reach their future. Let's talk about now a little bit about the Integrated Resources Plan. The thing with the Integrated Resources Plan that was not accepted, not to say rejected, by the Puerto Rico Energy Bureau, former Energy Commission, uh, time's up, I'm okay? Can I continue? One more minute. Okay, the issue with the Integrated Resources Plan is that it has a good goals, but the goals that are basically the goals of 1121 are not in accordance with their actions. Thank you. For example, new the new energy policy says that Puerto Rico should reach an RPS of 20%, now, now 40%, that's an update as per Senator Senhammer, by, by 2025, 60% by 2040, and 100% by 2050. Well, what PREPA proposed? Four gas terminals, two in San Juan, one in Maya West, and one in Yabucoa, at the cost of $1 billion, $47 million. Plus, three plants, three or four plants, let's be conservative, let's say three, of 300 megawatts, a dollar per watt is $900 million. So it's $1.9 billion 
y en natural gas infrastructure. Confidentiality. Guess what? Everything regarded by transmission and distribution prepa requests to be confidential. That was denied by the Energy Commission, saying that there are some parts that need to be confidential, but some others. The consumers, the people, needs to know. And cost, all that prepared to a cost from 23 to 25 cents kilowatt hour. So, to finish, Puerto Rico needs to transform electric system. This involves building a modern grid, a grid that can be support multiple power flows. And for that, we not only need the policy, because we have the policy, but we need to have a right implementation strategy so that policy can have an effect and we can have energy, an energy of the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tomas. As we've heard before, Puerto Rico is uniquely positioned right now to rethink its energy sector and rebuild a new grid with nature in mind, able to mitigate damage against future storms. Our last speaker will provide us her insight on how to listen to our communities to promote that real power shift. With you, Ms. Ingrid Villaviaggi, founder of Cambio Puerto Rico. Well, I would be remiss if I didn't start by throwing a challenge to the CNE, and it is to see how you can develop a program to increase the number of women in the energy conversation. <laughs> so, um, today I want to talk to you a little bit about the power shift and what it implies and means for Puerto Rico. Um, first of all, what images come to your mind when you think about technology? You probably think about an iPhone or a Tesla car. We tend to think of technology as tangibles. And yet, if we look at the, at the definition of technology, it is the practical application of knowledge or a capability given by the practical application of knowledge. So technology is not uh, comprised, it's not limited just to objects and tools. Technology also needs to be understood as a, as a social construct. So, People in society are constantly redefining what they consider best, what they value the most, becoming, to a great extent, drivers of technology development and adoption. Not always what is labeled as technological advancement is considered by society as such. Take, for example, the coal power plant uh, in Guayama. Um, it is based on fluidized bed combustion that, from an engineering point of view, it's advanced technology. Yet, from the view of society, this is considered a regression to the point that it's being rejected widely by society and everybody's asking for the shutdown of that facility. So if we're talking about cutting edge technology, we have to look at what society is defining as cutting edge. And in the case of Puerto Rico and energy, us at Cambio, we have been uh, defining cutting edge technology and the tension of the present times as best explained by Thomas Kuhn's concept of paradigm change. And Kuhn's cycle begins in a state of normal science where there is a solution to solve present problems. And for many decades, centralized fossil fuel generation solved Puerto Rico's energy needs. But the solution started facing problems with questions arising in terms of env environmental contamination, environmental justice, cost vulnerability, among others. Social values that were not previously considered. This caused the model to start to drift away from its satisfactory solution position. But since change always faces resistance, we saw administration after administration trying to patch up the system, saying, no, this model must work. It has worked for decades, refusing to acknowledge that the model is unable to solve present needs. Instead of acknowledging the need for a leap, a decision is made to add more capacity through private contracts that included 
coal and natural gas, thinking that must have been the problem, but clearly it wasn't. And the system then continues to accumulate anomalies, such as an excessive amount of debt, corruption to hide bad deals, and political intervention. The system is clearly failing, yet bad habits die hard. Then Hurricane Maria took that patched up system right into crisis mode. Now the system cannot respond. People have no power. Answers offered do not satisfy needs. A struggle then begins to find a suitable solution, and that is exactly where we are today, amidst a model revolution. A model revolution capable of setting a new energy paradigm for Puerto Rico. The question is whether the model revolution will be capable of freeing itself from the bad habits of the current model, centralized generation, fossil fuels, political intervention, corruption, to emerge as a true new paradigm. Because if the model keeps dragging on these bad habits, it will not be able to transcend and transform. In order to transcend and transform, though, we need to acknowledge uh, and be able to understand the current demands. And three very important lessons were derived from the experience of Hurricane Maria. First, and it has been mentioned uh, several occasions during the day, the impacts of climate change are here. Climate change is happening now, something that perhaps a couple of years ago was thought of something that could occur in the future, well, we're seeing it today. Second of all, our, second, our current energy model and system is, represents great personal and economic vulnerability. Thousands of lives were lost. Our economy was shut down because of lack of power. Third, there is great power to be harnessed in our communities. And I don't mean strictly energy power, but like John was mentioning earlier, power to drive change. People regain great confidence in being able to solve their problems. Thus, when we're talking about an energy model revolution, there is now greater social demand that the system will lead to improve quality of life in both normal and extreme conditions, reduce health and environmental impacts, capacity building, shared governance and transparency, and more equal distribution of benefits and burdens. So what shape could this paradigm change be taking if we allow all these values to feed in? Well, first of all, we could have a society with greater, stronger local economy, with a global integration through innovation exchange. Second of all, the individual would no longer be a passive actor, but assumes greater control and awareness, deriving true distributed power. And this is something that is similar to what we have seen over the past decade happening in the internet, where originally in the past we had a webmaster that would create content and we would be passive consumers kind of receiving all this information. And now we're moving towards uh, any of us creating content and in the future having more personalized services. Well, in energy, something similar is expected to happen. We need to move from a centralized system to distributed generation to system optimization where actually the individual and the community not only generate, but are able to combine their systems with efficiency and conservation, uh, moving us obviously towards true energy democracy. So the past year, a coalition of Puerto Rican and US-based organizations and experts defined a new energy paradigm for the island that incorporates all these values, priorities, and experiences. The report, Queremos Sol, in English, We Want Sun, outlines a power system transformation under public ownership, calling for an origin transition to 100% clean renewable energy based on efficiency, conservation, and demand management using rooftop solar and storage, and sh through a shared governance model rooted in local ownership and participation everyone should be able to reap the benefits of this energy transformation. Individuals, communities, cooperatives, small businesses. Energy is no longer a field limited to large public or private corporations. Obviously, the new paradigm is radically different from the current model, so different that the two are incommensurate. This causes a paradigm change resistance. 
and we are seeing resistance from PREPA management and elected officials who insist in fossil fuel investments as a first step in energy tra uh, sector transformation, whereas efficiency, conservation, providing solar and storage for resiliency at every home to lower demand should be the first step if we want to be able to transcend. Thank you. And there is to be expected resistance because the model demands a new approach. It requires a shift in power, providing greater control in the hands of citizens and communities. It requires understanding that energy is not an end in itself, but means by which we can offer a better future for Puerto Rico. It is a part actually of a greater paradigm change that is occurring worldwide where we're redefining the relationship between humans and the world. It requires changes that have to be led through public policy and not necessarily as a result of market opportunities. It requires accounting for externalities. It requires reversal on wealth drain associated with the current model. And this represents losses for those who currently control the model. And it means shutting up the valve of fossil fuel investments. So amid this tension between the old model and the new paradigm, what is required for this new paradigm to take off? Well, we need enough supporters for this to be accepted as the cutting edge response to the demands of the times. The cutting edge response that addresses our current values, our priorities, and our needs. This is why elevating energy literacy is so important. But think about it. What could be more cutting edge for Puerto Rico than becoming a role model for the transition to renewable energy for small island nations, a role model for bottom-up approaches for communities worldwide? Just like electrification of Puerto Rico in the last century was a tool that allowed for industrial development on the island, a current transition to renewables that shifts power to the people and communities could represent a step change in Puerto Rico's capacity and quality of life by addressing risk reduction, climate change, health, adaptability, equity, and democratization. And that not only would be a true paradigm change, but it would be a useful and smart application of knowledge. Thank you very much.